Hi, welcome to The Real Men of Real Estate. I am your host, Tunde Ogunwale. In this episode, we're gonna focus on land investment, what it is, what the process is, how to make money, and understand a little bit more about the risks and pitfalls in land investment. I am joined by Brian Fox, the CEO of the Fox Realty Group. Howdy. And Steve Matley, the founder and CEO of Coast to Coast Equities. Thank you. Good to see you, Tunde. It's good to see you again. So we'll just kick it off to you, Steve, because this yeah. is one of your this is your high fastball. Can you tell the audience a little bit more about land investment and what it is? Well, land investment, there's much too much to cover in one episode, so we're gonna boil it down into just the assets. The kind of projects that my company do is, is we go out and find underused land, and that means land that's not at its highest and best use. So for the people who don't understand what that means out there, that means we have land that may be zoned agriculture, rural, residential, low density, we could, under the general plan of the local agency, create a higher density. So for example, I have a piece of land, we just, a project we just started, it's 50 plus acres, it's agriculture, and you can have two dwellings on there. When we're done with it, it'll be R1, um, medium density, low density, we'll have over 200 home sites on that same property. So the value obviously goes up, you know, two sites on 50 acres of kitty litter versus 200 sites in a new community. You focused on a number of things there. So you identify that there's land available, but it's not being fully utilized. You use the language highest and best use, and you see an opportunity that you can improve on the existing land and create an opportunity to bring more people to that property or possibly a, a, better, a better benefit for the community. So think of like a fix and flip. Okay, but instead of a house, it's a piece of land. So people do the fix and flips if they've watched the TV shows where they do this kind of thing. They buy a house that is under market value because it needs help. It's not the prettiest house in the neighborhood. Then they go to Home Depot and buy a lot of parts and pieces. They spend the next few weekends breaking their back and working and sweating, cutting their fingers off. They put it all together. When they're done, they do open houses. They sell the house. Hopefully they made a profit on it because what they did took an undervalued piece of real estate turned it into a piece of real estate that has market value and maybe even a little better because they did a nice job on it and they sell it to someone who sees the higher value. Do the same thing with a piece of land. Fantastic. And just so I'm asking for the layman, when we say kitty litter, we actually mean any project that is very underutilized. It's, it's, it's a bunch of dirt. It's just a bunch of dirt, right? All right. Just making sure we got that. All right. Beautiful, got it. beautiful. It's dirt and sand out there. You really brought it home. You, you gave an example that most people, because a lot of us are familiar with residential construction, and I work in commercial real estate. You used an example that makes it really clear for us and the audience out there. Can you talk about the process of land investment and improving well, there is a very long, lengthy process, and the key to this is deciding, do you want to do the whole process, or do you want to do a piece of the process? My company's specialty is to do the front piece of the project. Now, we have the capability of doing it. I have done all of the project, you know, everything from beginning to end. But uh, the, the most ROI comes in the early part, but that's also the highest risk, and that is converting the land from underused to what would be a, a better use. You go through the zoning process. Okay. And, and, and the, the key here is location, 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 and not location in the sense that we have a great ocean view, not location in the sense that I have a rail spur or interstate freeway next door. It's location in the sense that I have an agency with jurisdiction, very pro-growth, and wants to see the development come in. Also an agency with jurisdiction that I can trust. What they, when they lay out, this is the rules you need to do, they mean it. They don't change the rules halfway through the game. Uh, okay. Some agencies may do that. Uh, some do, some don't. So we work with specific cities that we trust and we know who really want to have the development. Why would they want more homes and more traffic? Because they need those additional rooftops in order to lure the commercial in. They're not, they're, the cities get their money not from property taxes. They get them from the business licenses from the Home Depot, the Best Buy, the Walmart, the dry cleaners, the movie theater. Fantastic. They're not gonna build if there's not enough rooftops there. You, you identified a number of things. You not only explained the value creation, so what, we're, what we heard earlier was that in the early stages of development, you could really create a lot more value by seeing this underutilized and working through a political and a community process to increase the zoning and the sure. planning for a specific site. And then obviously there's other steps which your, your firm has expertise in. But right. you also said that this is a feeder. The benefit is not only for the future home builder, the future developer who's gonna go vertical with the site, but it supports other needs within the community, residential, commercial, and otherwise. So That's it's right. part of a bigger, bigger context. We're in Southern California and this is a national show. What are some of the elements of that approval process? What, in that early stage, to get a city or an agency having jurisdiction to really support 
this increased use? Describe how long it takes and what that process is. We're in California. So, so all the country is under what's known as NEPA. That's the National Environmental, National Environmental Protection Act. That is the things that drive um, what's best for the community from a national standpoint. Then each state has theirs. In California, we call it CEQA. That's the California Environmental Quality Act. This is what creates the process of having to go through open public hearings okay. before you change the use of land because you are affecting everybody around you. You're affecting the neighbors and the community. You're creating traffic. You're, you're impacting the schools. You're impacting the shopping areas. And so the community needs to understand what you're doing. In California, the CEQA regulations are very arduous and very strict. That's a negative you would think. Now, I have a partner in my company because I have two partners in my corporation. One of my partners lives in Ocala, Florida. Any, anybody in 120 days can do in Florida. Well, it'll take us up to three years to do in California. Yeah, okay. So there's no value in what we do because every builder can do it themselves. Sure. Why would they pay us? We are taking that risk and that cost and that time away from the builder's project. They, they buy the land from us and in 90 days they can start building. If they did it themselves, they might be out 18 months, 24 months, two years, right. or three years going Fantastic. up, right? Actually, yeah. I, I got a question for you on top of that. So uh, assuming you've got a local jurisdiction that yeah. you know their rules and regulations, you know how they'll do it, you know that. So if somebody was to say, let's say I suddenly said, you know what, that sounds neat. Let's go take a look at that. What are the key leading indicators you would pay attention to to know that that's the next question to ask? What are you looking at in that city, in that area, to say, okay, this would be a good spot they would be wanting some roofs. Like, okay. is there anything specific you look for? Well, one is, um, what is the current most recent history of similar type activity? So you look out there, let's say DR Horton's building, Lennar's building, KB's building out there. What did it take for them to get started? Mm -hmm. Maybe none of them are out there. It's smaller builders. It's little boutique builders out there. Mm -hmm. We have to ask, would a larger builder want to come out to this area mm -hmm. um, if, if the opportunity was, was correct? Now, the beauty is most of those companies have amazing marketing research they do before they step in an area. And if you can access any of the stuff, if, you, if a big company goes out there, you know the market research has been done and done right. Mm -hmm. So you look for those type of things. Also look for where's the pressure points. So we build, say, in Riverside County, Southwest Riverside County. Why does Southwest Riverside County in those areas off of the main interstate, why are those growing? Because it's being, you, the areas on the highways in Riverside County are too expensive to live. Why are, they, well, because the areas in North San Diego County and Orange County are too expensive to live. Because the areas in the urban centers of LA, Orange, and San Diego counties are too expensive to live. So it all keeps pushing out to where people end up buying their homes with commuting time. So you draft on that opportunity. So drafting yes. being like right behind the guy, the lead guy. So you're like, well, they did it. We're just one step behind him. Do it again. Yeah, or yeah. we look at where they are looking, but they're not yet. Got it. Because if we can provide the land for them, so for example, KB just ended up, uh, ended up a project in Southwest Riverside County. It was uh, five tracks. That was a project that we went through entitlement on about 15 years ago, and mm -hmm. we sold it to them. So, so we were kind of on the front edge of that. Um, fortunately, we had about eight projects in that valley going when Lennar moved into the valley. Mm -hmm. And so once they moved in, it was an easy sell. Every other builder says, well, they're there will come in. Yeah. And, and, and so the bigger builders all showed up. Uh, D.R. Horton was out there. All the big guys were out there. Syndex was out there. Um, so we look, at, we look at that. We look at um, what is the community like? What do they want? Uh, what works within the community that's already there? Not just the, not the city as an entity, but the people living out there. Because sometimes that's a disconnect. What the city wants and what the people in the community mm -hmm. want may be different. Site utilities. Are there utilities anywhere close by? I'm not going to chase a sewer to your two wells down the street. I want it to the site. Um, topography. I don't want to blast rocks out. I don't want crazy topography, you know, a cliff. It's got to be something easy to work with. So all those pieces together, and we say, that's the sweet piece of land. That's what we want. And then we buy land, and it's not necessarily for sale. We go find the land, and then we research who owns this land. I wonder if they want to sell this to us. Yeah. Got Fantastic. It. Steve, I, I learned a lot just learning a little bit more about the process. I was obviously aware of CEQA and some of the regulatory environment, but you've really laid out the process in great detail. When we come back, we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about the risks that are associated with being in the entitlement process in land development and understanding a little bit more about how land development is different than other forms of development.
appears these hot ashes are about to be dumped, which could possibly start a wildfire. How will Smokey deal with such a hot situation? The garden hose defense. Next, a thorough stir. Then, another spray. And finally, feeling if the ashes are cool. Oh, yeah. ah, yes, the selfie. A ritual practiced so frequently with this tribe, but not so much by Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome back to The Real Men of Real Estate. We just got done talking about land investment and the process and the difference between land investment and other product types. Steve, if you could just step us through some of the different steps of land investment. Okay, so in the first segment, we kind of got deep into that first step, which is acquiring the land and getting the entitlements uh, and somewhat involved there. But that's only the first step because once you've got the entitlements, you have to design the land meaning you have to lay out the lots. Where do the streets go? Where do the lots go? Where does the park go? Where's the school site? You're, you're, you're creating a new part of a town. It's a new community mm -hmm. you're creating. It, it could be very small, 13 homes, that's it. It could be very large, multiple tracks, public services, all type of stuff in there. Then you have to then procure the uh, engineering contractors that'll build that mm -hmm. and build it out. You have to go install streets, curbs, gutters, utilities, uh, common areas, parks, all the stuff that's going to go in there, uh, flood control systems, all that's got to go in. And now you have the base. Then you've got an architect who has to design the actual dwelling units. What is your product mix? Is it going to be individual homes, condos, apartments, townhomes, senior housing, whatever you're doing. Now, and then you've got to go procure those contractors. Those are the B contractors, the build, general building contractors. And then you have to build those homes in some organized fashion. We usually call them phasing, mm -hmm. where we go through and we build 10, 12, 15 homes at a time because that's what the market can absorb as we finish them up. That's the whole process and then turn those over and actually sell those and make money. Each one of those steps has its own unique risk and its own unique opportunities uh, as, as you go through the process. And you can do all of it mm -hmm. and you can do some of it. it. Depends. And there are people that may build that whole process out and maybe they build apartment homes and they're actually going to hold on to it and property manage that thing and then maybe sell it 10 years later. So there, there's a lot of ways to go on this. Um, I, I will tell you some of the um, some of the risk you have is figuring out. I have to design the land for the product I'm going to build. If I'm going to build uh, 2,500 square foot homes, I need to build lots that are going to sell to those people. Do they want 4,000 square foot lots, 6,000 square foot lots, 8,000 square foot lots, 10,000 square foot lots? What's going to work for that product mix? Uh, apartment buildings. How does that all lay out? And that's where I really have to have my ear to the ground on what are people buying right now because. Homes are like any other sort of uh, what I'd call fashion, whether it's car design or clothing or whatever it is, architecture and homes go in trends. What do we like interior, what do we like exterior, what are the amenities we like, high ceilings, low ceilings, lots of bedrooms, a few bedrooms. What do we want to see in there? Uh, and, and that's where we want to look, talk to the people that really understand that. Uh, people like say Brian, for example, he works with people every day that are picking and choosing where they want to live based upon certain amenities and what they look like. So I want to look for an expert like that and say, what are people right. buying, Brian? Right. Yeah. So, so actually, I got a question for you. So two things. One, yeah, I mean, it's funny. Um, I actually have this game I play with my clients. And I say, guess what year it was built by looking at what they put in it. That's right. And it's pretty fun because it, you can take baseboards and doors more than anything else. You can pull the decade, <laughs> right? Because in the 70s, 80s, there wasn't a lot of construction money. So baseboards and doors were very simple. Uh, kitchens, what color? Like for mica, for mica was like something they only put in. It's like that fabricated wood tile, yeah. only one of certain things. But back to this, is the process exactly the same on every kind of size of project? What I mean by that is if I was, let's say, not talking to a group who was going to be a DR Horton or a Lennar, a large home builder, and it was just somebody who's saying, well, I want to entitle, I want to change this uh, low density to high density, and I'm trying to take this SR, SR1 and turn it into a four unit. Because mm -hmm. I can do that same basic entitlement and I can still make a swap on that That's and right. sell it to somebody mm -hmm. else. It's a great profit to me because if I have a $500,000 lot, I now have a $2 million lot. Right. You know, is it the same or is you, it you slightly can, different? You can do that. And, and here's, you know, here's the upside to it. It's a lot simpler. Okay. Uh, you, you don't have as many pieces, you know, parts of pieces to go through. The downside is, is you are now, you, have, you still have to create a track map, a tentative track map that you're going to sell. Okay. A tentative map is meaning I'm dividing the pieces up like this. But you've done it generically for the average buyer. Anytime you do anything generically for the average buyer, 
you've automatically eliminated some buyers of special needs, right? right? Mm -hmm. and, and so there, the risk on that is, what if I designed it and it doesn't quite fit anybody's product? Mm -hmm. Now it's harder to sell. So it's always good to, even if you don't have a specific buyer in mind, talk to the most likely types of buyers and get their input on it. So the process is similar. The process is very similar. Okay. It, really what, what it comes down to, the difference is, is how you direct your designers to do the, the, the fine part of the design. Got it. But the okay. process doesn't change at all. Okay, interesting. Does it take less time? Sorry, I was gonna, does it take the same amount of time as a bigger project? Is it similar? Well, up to a point. So as long, until you get up to where you need a full-blown environmental impact report. Okay. So if you're just doing a tentative track map, it really doesn't matter if you're doing 10 lots or you're doing 100 lots. Got There's it. a big difference in those, but that's sure. the same process because it's not a huge project, you know, 50, 60 acres or something. If you're getting up into something where you've got, say, three or 400 acres mm -hmm. and you're going to have five or six tracks in there, you, you are now in what's known as a specific plan. Gotcha. And okay. that, that is a much longer process, several years longer. For old environmental impact reports, instead of just going to planning commission, you probably go to city council as well. There's, there's more steps and processes, but a lot more money to be in on the backside. You've got to be a little more patient before you get there. It's going to take longer. Yeah, I mean, I don't know yeah. if I've ever been as ambitious to do what you're doing, but I mean, I can always find opportunity in my neighborhoods for like, Guy owns a giant lot, used to be a horse, horse barn, and I could find something like that. I mean, I could. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you a quick and easy thing you can do. Mm. Go search the database for pieces of land that are not at their highest and best use. For example, you live in Orange County. Mm. What if you found a piece of land in Orange County, it was zoned for three dwelling units, there's only one dwelling unit on it? Got it, yeah. So yeah. you go down and what do you do? You go subdivide that into three different parcels sure. yeah. and now you sell two of those off. Yeah. Or you can build those off and manage those units as yeah. a property manager. One of the things I'm taking away is that the process is similar, residential, commercial, and land development. Right. There's a lot of steps that are similar amongst them and you've got a unique background where you've worked in residential and, and, and commercial. Yes, I I'd love to hear your reason for being in land development. Why land development? <laughs> Not a lot of people know about land development. You've got a passion for it. There, here, here's here's the, the gist of the whole deal. Find whatever is the most productive with the least amount of effort is my motto, right? That would be great if we could only make the most amount of money doing the least yeah. amount of work. There you go. Yes. And what nobody else understands. If nobody else understands it, you, you don't it. have a lot of competition <laughs> out there. You can't screw it up. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a lot of competition and um, you don't have... Um, you don't have a lot of precedent going against you or anything like that. You're basically creating things that are more flexible. So I, I got into this. I was actually doing commercial construction management. I was doing uh, public works infrastructure, uh, vertical construction, schools, universities. I was doing private development as an outsourced project manager, okay. all that kind of work. And I started doing this because it didn't compete with the company I was working for. Interesting. They did Interesting. not do residential work, okay. other than uh, litigation support when things got people got sued sure. at the end of it. But I was like, they didn't do that kind of work. So I was able to do that on my own without competing with the company I worked for, really just to build up my own retirement. That's all I was doing it for. And I got to a point where I was, after a few projects, you look and you go, let's see, um, I made this much money on a few weekends and evenings, and I made this much money working 60 hours a week, and uh, this much money was twice as much as this one. Duh. Yeah. Right? So what do you do? You go and do that full time for a while, right? So you highlighted a couple of things. You <laughs> saw a niche that was different than what you were doing in your daytime job. You yeah. did horizontal construction management. You did vertical construction management, public sector, big projects. You saw a little niche in this land development side where you're like, well, it's not competing with my daytime work, and there's a little bit of pop that could be made. The downside of it. When I used to, when I used to point out to people when I, I built infrastructure that was, you know, uh, downtown San Diego where the trolleys come in and out, that's one of my projects. I point to it and go, look, I did that. And I, and I go to a high rise over, the, I built that. And I go to, to Los Angeles and there's twin, I built those. Everyone, oh, that's really cool, Steve, that's amazing. I got paid salary and bonus for those things. Then I did, yeah. I was a VP mm -hmm. of a home builder. Mm -hmm. We built tract homes. Right. Nobody brags about building track homes. When you say I built the track, they go, well, you're the guy that caused the traffic problem, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? I made a lot more money at that. And then when I just did the land, you can't brag about that at all. What do you do? Drive by and say, I had that in escrow? Nobody cares. <laughs> but I made the most amount of money doing that, and there's no prestige whatsoever. So there's an inverse relation sometimes with how people perceive what you're doing versus how much you're actually making. That's, right. a, that's, a, good, that's a great point that... that your attachment to the physical structure is a little bit different than it is to the entitlement process or the approvals. That said, there's money to be made. It's, right. It doesn't compete with a lot of work that a lot of people are more familiar with, which is, which right. is fantastic. Are there any closing thoughts that you wanted to share with the group in terms of aspects of land development that really... Okay, so, so as I said, most people don't know it. And it's a mysterious thing. And they think, okay, that's just those, those big developer people to do. The real estate moguls do that kind of stuff. I'm no mogul. I'm just some guy 
that was out there working in the industry and tried to find a way to make a little more money. And I got in by doing what we what kind of syndicated land deals. It, the other thing, it didn't take me any money because I didn't have the money to put into yeah. it. What I did was I raised money from other people and I partnered up with someone who had been doing this a long time. He had land. I had access to investors. We put the two things together. We went and did a few projects. I learned that side of it. And next thing you know, we're just doing one project after another. Well, fantastic. Well, you definitely shared a lot of basics as it relates to land development, the risks and benefits. With that, we'll take a quick commercial break and come back and talk a little bit more about the key takeaways that we had. Thank you. These hot ashes are about to be dumped, which could possibly start a wildfire. How will Smokey deal with such a hot situation? The garden hose defense. Next, a thorough stir. Then, another spray. And finally, feeling if the ashes are cool. Oh, yeah. ah, yes, the selfie. A ritual practiced so frequently with this tribe, but not so much by Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome to The Real Men of Real Estate, where we talked about all things real estate. Specifically in this episode, we focus on land investment. We walked through the process, got to understand what the risks and opportunities are, and we spent a little bit of time talking about the support between land investment and residential. Brian Fox has got a number of thoughts as it relates to finding those opportunities. Brian, did you have a couple thoughts you wanted to share with us? Well, so, I mean... As we were talking about our stuff, obviously the, the range of possible viewers for what we're talking about and the customers for who we would work with is very, uh, it's wide. So um, in your world, we talked about DR Horton, Lennar, who the end customer would be. And I think it's important to realize that, that there are multiple end customers. And so the reason I was asking some of the questions I was regarding you know, the process being the same and can you do the same thing for low density, high density, smaller complexes, because um, many of the older neighborhoods, even where I live, so... Uh, Costa Mesa, Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, I mean, those are old money cities. And uh, originally, people may not know this, but Newport Beach is the mecca. Of, people think that is the city for value and money. Uh, but Huntington Beach was the rich neighborhood because it had all the oil. Well, in that, they also had larger lots, which slowly shrunk over time with entitlement, right? They'd shrink them down, and they'd figure out what the, the smallest buildable lot would be. Well, there's still some old ranch homes over there, and you can still take a lot of this same value and find local opportunities that are in your neighborhood that may not be you know, 500 acres, but it may be one acre parcel or one half acre parcel where the minimum is down to 4,000 or 5,000 square feet and you can actually drop that down. So I thought it would be really good to make that clarification so people understand the value they can use from what you're talking about. You can actually use in any neighborhood. That's right. You just do it on a micro level. Totally. Do, do a single lot and break it into two pieces. 100%. If, if that's what it's zoned for and you, you can just double your value right there. Totally. But yeah, that was what I wanted to add. Right. Perfect. Um, yeah, the great thing about uh, these kind of projects is they are there's a lot of opportunity out there, and they don't all look the same. You can do entire communities, or you can do just little onesie twosie type stuff. You can even convert a single house into maybe an apartment building if it's designed for that price, and maybe do you know five, six, eight units on there. Um, that's a great opportunity to do it with. And the beauty is anybody can get into this deal. It, anybody can get in. You don't need to have a huge pot of money in the background. Um, like I say most of our investors that come in, they come in with $10,000, dollars $20,000, $30,000 into a syndicated deal. They pool their money together and create a pool of money that's a half million dollars, three quarters of a million to go do these projects. And then they get their share of the upside. And they're very high ROI because they are considered the higher risk type, type projects. But we mitigate the risk again by the, a the agency with jurisdiction and knowing what we're doing is experience. Don't go out and just try to do it on your own if you don't know what you're doing. You'll better chance of getting burned than making money. So at that point, partner up with someone who knows it. If you could give two or three bullets for us in the audience on ways to get into land investment, what would those? those well, I say the first thing is is find the people that already know what's doing what they're doing and partner up with them any way you can. Sometimes you can invest into a REIT that's doing these kind of projects. Right? That's that's just a trust. Uh, you, you can use your self-directed IRA and get into a project using your um, retirement money 
to get into a project and grow your retirement account. Again, you know, it doesn't take that much. Ten, twenty thousand dollars can get you into one of these projects, and you get your upside to it. That's the easiest and simplest way to do it. And then, kind of as it's going through, see if you can learn a few things on the way. Fantastic. Well, thanks again for joining us on the Real Men of Real Estate. We focused on land investment. We talked about what land investment is, what the process is for land investment, the pitfalls and the opportunities within land investment, and different ways that you could get in. I want to thank you as your host, Tunde Ogunwale, and my two panelists, Brian Fox and Steve Matley. Stay tuned to The Real Men of Real Estate. You can find us on Roku and Amazon and TheRealMenOfRealEstate.com.